for all the many, many videos I've done on this channel, I haven't actually done a review of competitive Splatoon, like, ever. And today I wanted to talk about it, and that means strictly competitive today. No solo queue, no casual play, nothing. This is all about tournament scrim, competitive top-level play. And yes, before we get started, I know the game is not done yet, but we're a lot closer than people realize. We are closer to the end of Splatoon's balance cycle than the beginning, as of what we know right now. And considering that the last three patches haven't really changed much, the meta might not change a lot either. I think it's a good time to talk about what we have, what works, what doesn't, and what I want to see change. With that being said, if more competitive talk sounds up your alley, be sure to subscribe. Before we get too deep into it, let's break down the basics of what are the most important attributes of competitive Splatoon, because that's different between games. Splatoon 1 was very fast and fight heavy, Splatoon 2 is very slow and coordination heavy. What matters in Splatoon 3? Two things, speed and resources. Speed is basically the same as it was in Splatoon 1. You move very fast, Tacticooler is active so you're fighting a lot, quick respawn and fighting based playstyles are good, and most importantly, the map design means space taking is very important. Let's give a simple example. Say you get three people down. If you approach mid really slowly and cautiously, the pencil who's remaining is going to give jumps to all three teammates and you're going to have to fight. Go a little bit faster and the pencil's alive, but they're probably going to be pushed out of mid and you'll take control. But if you go really fast, you might kill the pencil or force them to jump out entirely, meaning that the enemy team loses more space. The faster you are, the more reward you get for doing the right thing. Secondly is resources. Part of this is like Splatoon 2, stuff like how many specials or even subs you want to use in the team fight. If you have to burn Azuka for someone you probably could have just shot. I mean, they had no ink in the corner there, but okay. You kind of just wasted Azuka that you could have had in the next fight. However, resources are a lot more than just subs and specials. Mainly, where people have to look and where they have to go has become more important than ever. If you get people to look into a poor area of the map that isn't really great, that's a lot of resources for your team to push. And considering how fast top level moves, most fights are decided by who is playing the more favorable angles, influencing where the enemy team stands, and most importantly, where they look. These aspects tie together to incentivize active play. This means we have a very fast-paced metagame. Even passively farming special in the corner for a little bit means losing a lot of potential value. You can have really positive KDs, but if you're not moving in, you're not doing good, even if it looks like you're doing good, which to me is a positive. Sitting back and not doing anything playstyles, special spamming playstyles, and overly defensive playstyles have never been weaker. And while those should have some degree of things you can do with them, they shouldn't really be that good. Splatoon is at its best when it's playing to its fast-paced nature, and they do a good job balancing it here without going too over the top like they did in Splatoon 1. That being said, let's talk about the balance of the game a little bit. Right now, backline and support diversity sucks. The main weapon you pick for both of these is pencil. It is very rare to see another backline. It is very rare to pick another support. There are some viable options, but you are committing to having to work significantly harder than just picking pencil more times than not. However, frontline is doing pretty good, of course. There is a lot of different options you can run, and even though we have figured out a lot more about the meta than back in the no meta era, there is still quite a sizable amount of frontline players winning. So a lot of flexibility or one tricks pushing relatively high tier weapons are both performing well right now if you play frontline, which is still the majority of weapons in the game. And remember, balance is more than variety. It's good that most unhealthy playstyles aren't good right now. There are some weapons in the game, like Gold Arrow Spray for instance, which is basically just set on farming Booyah Bomb, that yeah, probably for the better that it's not good, because I don't know if you want to imagine what an Arrow Spray that isn't reworked would look like if it was a top tier. Another thing is the special balance. This is a lot worse. There has pretty much always been a gap between specials that actually get you in versus specials that don't. Considering how the maps are very difficult to move in as a whole, I'll get to that later, it's very important to have specials that can give you some way to either get more space or hold the space you already have. Specials that serve that purpose are pretty powerful generally as well, with stuff like Inkjet, Zooka, Crab Tank, or Booyah Bomb being prominent examples. And pretty much any tier list over time for this game in terms of specials has always gravitated towards the ones they give you in. The sole exception is Tacticooler, and that's because Tacticooler cheats. For one thing, Tacticooler allows everyone to run in, play fast, and go for hero plays you couldn't normally do, and then come back with the good specials they're probably running anyway that you need to get in. And Cooler's 100% special saver also makes it annoying to take out some players using specials since they can just respawn with most of it charged anyway, such as killing a Zuka user after they've used two shots only for them to retain like 70% of it. This is a problem that will probably 
never really be fixed completely, but it is a little bit sad how we have some specials that could fit this category, like Chumps or Wavebreaker, that we aren't buffing a lot, or other specials like Reef Slider, which could in theory fit them, but are getting buffed in the wrong direction instead of enabling them to get their teams in. The good specials right now also have some problems. Trizuka is one of the worst specials we've ever had at a top level. It's so incredibly fast and instant that it makes plays feel like they can be unreactable at times or at worst feel kind of random. The giant hitbox of the indirect hits as well as how fast you can shoot them are just kind of laughable. Even if we compare it to Inkjet, that has like half the radius practically and shoots slower and has shots that travel slower. The special just feels blatantly overtuned and it having good matchups against pretty much every other special in the game right now is a big part of why it's pushed so many other important ones like Crab Tank out of the meta. And let me get back to the point of talking about skill expression. It is really important that specials both feel satisfying to use playmaking wise, but even more important, feel like they have counterplay. Zuka at least is somewhat satisfying to counter, but a lot of the specials aren't. If you just shark a tri-strike user and they pop it at the bad time, you just kill them. If there is a whale user, it doesn't even feel any different fighting them. How satisfying is it to paint over a tri-strike so they don't cap the zone? A lot of the best design specials in this game, like Jetpack, Crab Tank, Zipcaster, or Booyah Bomb, not only have many different satisfying ways to use them, but they also feel really good to counter. Holy sh- Bro. Bro! It should feel like getting a pick on them is a huge hype moment and big deal. And the problem is that most of the specials that are being picked at top level right now, the ones that are actually common, whether they're being carried by a strong weapon like Range Blaster or are just genuinely really good like Zuka, is that there isn't a lot of satisfying counterplay or a lot of satisfying playmaking capability to do with these specials. And it leaves an entire aspect of the game feeling incredibly hollow and bare bones. There need to be a lot of the best specials in the game with high skill expression. It's mostly a competitive thing, but it's really important important that good players are able to actually express their skill with the specials in the game, and the majority of what we're seeing is not letting that happen. And to clarify, there are strong skill expression specials in the game, like Inkjet and Crab that I mentioned earlier that are strong right now, but they're seen very rarely due to being on very limited kits and having a lot of weaker matchups recently, particularly against Zuka. So even though they exist, it's not that relevant. I mean, think about the last time you've seen a jetpack in a non-gimmick tournament, even though it's pretty good. That's what this limitation can mean. Before we get the maps, the kits have been another hot topic. I'll do a whole review of the kit system at one point, but at a competitive level, what's worth noting is that a few weapons have very strong kits. Most have kind of half kits that work, usually one piece that works or some amount of limited synergy or power, and then some weapons have nothing. If you have a really insanely good main weapon, you can make up for that a lot of the time. Like Range Blaster has Wavebreaker, but you're not getting a lot of that and you mostly pick it for the range, so it's not the end of the world. Or even stuff like Dreadringer, which has Slider, but it's not the end of the world either. It has some good synergy and use cases, and it isn't that bad on the weapon. However, some weapons have such terrible kit luck that they're not able to see any use at all, even with competent main weapons, such as the Dapples or Mini. Dapples being an especially egregious example because they had the same problem three times in Splatoon 2. How have we still not given this weapon a functional kit five times later? Another thing that's worth noting is that there are some weapons that really deserve to get more kits in terms of playstyles. For example, Dreadringer is something that I got disappointed by, and is one of the reasons why I think it's so important to give a weapon like Dread a strong kit, because that weapon with a good kit would open up many different ways of playing the game. It's an area of effect weapon that also paints very well as a frontline. That allows you to pair it with stuff like blasters, rollers, or sloshers. Typically, you can't pair something like a blaster or roller together, or are significantly limited if you do so. This opens many different comps. Just for fun, I played Explosher, Dynamo, Dreadringer, Splash to really spec into this area of effect paint style comp, and had more fun than I've had in months, because compared to the way you have to play the game a lot of the time, this felt different, and this is one thing we need a lot more of. There's not a lot of different play styles in the game. There's a lot of different weapons you can pick, but everything plays mostly the same way. Having more weapons be good and have kits that can enable other weapons with unique play styles are a great way to enable multiple different strategies and styles of comps, but right now that's extremely limited even if there is a good bit of weapon diversity. Though part of this just ties back to the roles. For example, Expo and Dynamo are really hard to pick anyway because most of the time pencil is an easier and better option for those roles. There are niche cases though, and potentially this is an area patches could make it better. 
let's talk about map and modes real quick. If you've been paying attention to the competitive scene, you might have noticed Zones Only has gotten a lot more popular. And that's because Clan Blitz and Rainmaker are at their weakest. Clan Blitz has baskets that are more far away, generally compared to Splatoon 2, a lot higher of a chance to drop clams due to the amount of team fights happening, meaning it's really difficult to score, and of course, crack and cheese, where you can just crack into the basket, instantly super jump with cooler QSJ, then throw in your power clams, keep all of your special, and respawn instantly for the next fight. Clan Blitz does usually have the best map layouts, so this is extra unfortunate. Rainmaker, on the other hand, I think is more understandable. This objective has always been about creative freedom with mixing up different paths, and the map design in this game does not let it happen. The checkpoint system only having one or two means that there's pretty much always only one or two actual paths. A lot of times spread out very far to be able to use them, or have one path that is just straight up so much worse than the other that you almost never see it used. The whole point of the flexibility of the objective is just not there. And on top of that, it's the most prone to stalling in the entire game. A lot of good teams tend to just camp very good leads when it does happen, which is not fun to watch or play. Tower control is probably the closest to being good. It does have a special advantage problem, but that's not that big a deal right now. It's mostly just that a lot of maps don't really work for tower control very well, but with some of the new maps, there is a possibility it gets a little bit better. Zones, on the other hand, isn't perfect either, and in fact, in zones only, I think the main problem is that most of the zones maps still aren't great. But compared to the other modes, there's a lot more maps that are pickable on zones, and the way zones is an objective functions allows the specials in the game to work the best. There is zones cheese, but then you're beelining to the zone, wasting a special and promptly dying, which is a great way to immediately lose the team fight. There's a good example of this at Genesis, where once I start going for zones cheese on Mako, you can see that my team tends to be stuck on defense a lot, which is why I think it's a bit more limited in competitive play than solo, and something you should really only do if necessary or if time is low. Not like there's many good reef slider weapons or slider is very good anyway. The maps have gone better recently with ramen being a banger stage, and Marlin, while not being perfect, is still way better than the stuff we had at the start of the game. But the problem at this point is, the reworks aren't changing very much, as is evident with Mincemeat and Maki outside of the Splat Zones layout, and, well, we probably only have one or two stages left given there's only one more season. Which means even if the map design was on par with Splatoon 1 endgame tier maps, we still would barely be getting any of them to actually fix that problem. This means that a year and a half later, we're still dealing with playing on many horrible map mode combinations in competitive play, whether we're doing zones only or all modes. It's a problem we can't seem to get past, and one that continues to limit the amount of things you can do in the game. Competitive play is the part of the game that I enjoy. There's a stereotype that comp players hate the game, but they don't. There are some of the most hardcore fans, but it's just that especially more dedicated competitive players who've been around for a while or have gone up high enough tend to know a lot more about the game and therefore express more of its flaws. No one who plays comp is doing so to trash the game. There's no reward for playing comp. If you're playing it, you're doing it because you like it. At least I hope. I don't know why else you would play. Personally for me, when I saw Splatoon 3, I saw a game that wasn't hindered by crucial flaws in the way Splatoon 2 and 1 were. One that had aspects like special design that have improved to a significant degree. This game has had more potential than any other game, and the reason it gets so much flack is that it's not living up to it. Don't get me wrong, it's still probably the best game in the series at a competitive level, and almost certainly is outside of it, but there's a lot of potential to the game that isn't being lived up to. And for me, I hope that this was the game to really push the Splatoon series. The balance patches lately and the map reworks though have shown me that the ambition isn't there right now. Things are slowing down and it seems like the devs are getting more content with where the game is, and I can't help but wonder what Splatoon 3 could have been like if there was just a little bit more drive to take the game just a little bit further. If we were able to do a little bit more with the kits, if we were able to do a little bit more with the maps, the special balancing. We saw some really creative ideas recently, especially with stuff like the Wavebreaker and Inkstorm changes, and I'm left to wonder if we're going to get more cool stuff like that that I think even casual players can enjoy, or if we're just going to get patches like the last one. This game definitely made a lot more steps than Splatoon 2 did competitively. However, I don't think it's going to reach the level of potential it truly has, and that's something I have to hope that either gets fixed by a content extension or in Splatoon 4. If it's any sign though, the maps, a bit of the special design, and hopefully some improvements to the kit in the next game mean that I think we have a lot to look forward to eventually. I just hope we get there. Thanks for watching.